just being consistent in your values, whatever the situation, like 100% of the time, it's those behaviors and actions that, that set culture and tone. Welcome to Vibecast, the podcast that dives deep into the heartbeat of workplace culture. I'm your host, Christy Skutvik. Join me in conversations with extraordinary leaders as we unravel their experiences, both positive and negative, that have impacted workplace culture. This podcast is more than storytelling. It's about actionable insights. Are you ready to transform the vibe at your workplace? Let's go. Today, I talked with Jamie Jacobs. Jamie is the co-founder of Gig Talent which is a modern talent collective that provides on-demand access to highly skilled, vetted, and passionate HR consultants and leadership coaches for companies that need immediate impact and business results. She is passionate about leadership and empowering people to do the work they love and create the life they want. She has built impactful, high-performing teams and thriving cultures in Fortune 50 companies and fast-growing startups. She has also co-authored an award-winning book on designing exceptional organizational cultures. She is driven by the mission of building aligned organizations in which the business, its leaders, and all individuals achieve their full potential and enjoy the journey. And when I think about a vibe, I immediately want to touch my stomach. Like I feel like, does it feel good when I'm walking in or do I like not feel good? And you can tell, right? I mean, it's contagious. So for me, when I think about like vibe at work, it's really like, are people having fun? Do you hear laughter? Do you feel like people are motivated, like they're working on something meaningful? Or is it super quiet? There's no interactions. That's the vibe, right? And we all know you're going to prefer one over the other. Do you have the Sunday scaries or not, right? (laughs) Right. Like, do I want to go there in the morning? Am I dreading it uh, in the car? Like, that's certainly a vibe. And I've kind of gotten to the place where if that's it, then I find a way to stop going to that place because it's just not worth it. So I'd love to hear some stories from you and your journey to the place that you're at today and how that journey of working for Fortune 50 companies and now running your own organization, like what your journey has been that has got you to where you're at that has created the vibe that you're now creating for your organization and the people you serve? I feel so lucky. You know, I started with large companies. I started with Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, which is all about culture. And clearly you can't deliver great service unless you have a great culture and your employees feel like they're treated well. And so to learn, you know, I was in college and, and working there. That really, I think, was foundational to my whole approach to work and to what work should be. And so, you know, going to other Fortune 50s and I remember 2009, I'm sitting in my office and I had this great job, great company, great friends, great life, but I felt disconnected from it. And then I was like on this personal journey about really recognizing the role that fear can play in your life and also the amount of choice that we have. And so as I later went on into other leadership roles in large companies and then was a head of HR in a fast growing startup that was all about culture, and I really saw the connection to the vibe and the culture and the impact on the work itself, on the organization, and how, like, things you can do to really make that culture and vibe strong, but also how quickly it can be eroded if you don't really adhere to your values or call out bad behavior and those kinds of things. And so as this, like, leader of it, but also participant and observant of it, when I decided to go on my own, I mean, that was really why, like, when I looked at what I love doing, it was about building and transforming and change, but it was also about making places great places to work. I just think that comes together with that element of choice. We all have lots of choices of where we work and how we make money and what that looks like. And quite frankly, life is just too short to do it somewhere that has a bad vibe or bad culture. You have that dread driving into work. So that was like the whole kind of, that's why we wrote a book about culture. It's why we launched Gig Talent was to really help support people who have decided to go on their own, but maybe they have a little bit of fear around kind of the sales and marketing end of it and want to feel like they have that sense of community. And so it's been really cool to see it come to fruition and to be living something that I think is part of a solution for some people who's yeah. made, who have made that choice in their journey. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. So take me back for a minute about some of the ways or the experiences that you had internally at Four Seasons that created that culture and that vibe. 
and maybe really great ones and maybe really not so great ones. Just tell me a little bit more specifically what it was and what they did and how they created it. There was a lot of training. They really invested in helping people understand what great service means. And think about this. So I was 19 or something, right? You have young people. You have people from all different socioeconomic things. You've got people who are in stewarding and housekeeping all the way at front desk and back of house and all, all kinds of people, very diverse. And you're trying to explain to them what five-star service for people paying $1,000 a night or whatever it is, what they expect. And many of us had never experienced that ourselves. So how do you convey that? And they had some really wonderful programs that they just ingrained people in what that means. And they they had one core value or principle, which was called the golden rule, right? Treat others as you would like to be treated. At the time, you don't really get it because you're just in it and you start like drinking the Kool-Aid. But when you apply it in other environments, you're like, oh, I get it. What was yeah. cool was down to me or any frontline person, you knew that you were empowered to make a decision. If you were making a decision that was going to create a better experience for a guest, you were empowered to do it. And so wow. because they were so clear in their purpose and their values and they rewarded that behavior, and it does, right? Like I can remember guests being wowed by something that a concierge did or the front desk did or a housekeeper did. And it's because they were on their own in the moment could find those ways to innovate and deliver a great customer experience. And so many companies miss that opportunity because they're not clear and people don't know where they're really empowered. And talk about the opposite of that, which I think you mentioned is like fear-based, right? So if you are not empowered, then you're reacting out of fear and then you don't make the best decision ever, personally or professionally, right? It's so true. You know, people play small and they're just trying to do what they think is safe. But I have a general belief that most people want to do great work and actually want to feel good about what they're doing. And so if you create that environment that allows people to feel empowered to do that and that they have the leeway to do their job in the best way that they can, that might yeah. be authentic to them within a framework, of course, or within a purpose, okay. but we're going to actually get more from everyone and deliver better. And, you know, it also hits the mark when we start talking about inclusion and inclusive environments and healthy environments versus toxic environment. All, all those things, I think, come from one, there being a kind of an expectation and then a support and rewarding the things that, that you want to see. What did that look like when somebody made a decision that may have not been the best one? Because I have to imagine like you're not – Four Seasons is massive, right? There's going to be decisions that maybe weren't fully thought through or uh, maybe somebody didn't care as much. Like, So I have to imagine that like the opposite side of that too also supported bringing people back to that empowerment. A hundred percent. So there, and there's kind of like two ways that can go wrong. Right? One is somebody just missed the mark and – didn't either really think it through as far as what that customer experience would be or didn't go the extra mile. So that was always about coaching and talking about the opportunities and what we'd like to see done next time. And there's also a business change. So like I was working there in 2001 during 9-11 and the hospitality industry was hit really hard and there were financial impacts. And so everyone was looking at cost, right? And if you had a do whatever it takes mentality, you weren't really talking about cost. I mean, people weren't doing crazy things, but now sending amenities over the top of amenities wasn't like something that we could just do without thinking, right? And so there was a little bit of education around some parameters to kind of keep that empowerment, keep that customer focus, but also educate and create the boundaries so that people could still do that in a way that worked for the business. But that was a substantial change. And they had to navigate it pretty smartly so that it didn't, it wasn't counter to the culture or the guest experience they were trying to do, but it also like was business yeah. smart. And they actually navigated it really well. I mean, another example with them at that time was Four Seasons did, all hotels dropped their room rates, but Four Seasons mm -hmm. only went so far because they didn't cut services like concierge and some of those other things, mm -hmm. whereas like Ritz Carlton did, but you could get into the Ritz for $99. And when you look at the recovery, it took Ritz a long time to catch back up to where Four Seasons was from a room rate perspective, because if you were a guest and were expecting the same level of service and you showed up and paid the $90, but you didn't have a concierge to make your dinner reservation, you might not have gone back. They really had a long-term approach to 
staying true to their culture and level of service, but they did make adjustments, right? They had to make adjustments. Gosh, that is so true about like the future impact to the decisions that you make today and really keeping your true north, your true north. And that's a great, like very practical example of like, dropping room rates only to a certain degree to continue to create the experience. And then you've hired these people to create the experience. So it's not like you're pulling it apart, asking them to change and then swinging the pendulum over here. And how often like organizations do that is they like react versus thinking through, okay, what do we stand for? What's our true purpose? How do we get creative? But it probably goes back to that empowerment, right? If they were empowering people throughout the organization to be creative, you can get pretty dang creative. You totally can. I remember we had like a, we called it innovation, like I-N-N, because we're- Oh, uh -huh. Right, uh -huh. innovation line. And, and we were really asking everyone for ways to innovate. We were asking, really involving people in that ongoing change. And I think that we're seeing that today pretty dramatically. Companies that are navigating the pace of change are ones that have normalized or operationalized change into their cultures. And so if you, it's like we're on a collective experiment or we're collectively yeah. building our culture and our organization's success, then I think that creates, that just sets you up for a better success. And it also is more enrolling. Wouldn't you want to contribute to that? So right. I, I think that we're seeing that and people who are kind of more fixed mindset and don't have change as like a normal thing, they're really struggling right now because we know that the pace... Everybody's changing whether you want to be or not. At a pretty fast clip, I would say. <laughs> 100%. So let's fast forward to your startup days. You mentioned you can see like how awesome it could be as you're embracing the culture, you're building the culture and how one thing can change it to create some toxicity or just turn it pretty fast. So can you give an example of that? And you can don't need to say names. You can preserve those <laughs> Part of that, uh, maintain their innocence or what have you. But I'd love to hear just like your experience on the ground of like how easy it is to go from great to terrible. We were really lucky. We had really good people who cared about things. But what I, it just really clear a couple of things. One, how visible leaders are and the meaning that people are making of what you say and do and what you don't say and do. There's a couple of silly examples. Like one was I posted something on LinkedIn supporting an organization that I was like a workforce development organization I was part of. Mm -hmm. And our company had gone through a layoff. And internally, someone in came in and complained that it was really insensitive for me to support this workforce development thing when we had gone through a layoff. And I'm like, whoa, mm -hmm. I didn't think people, well, one, it didn't actually make sense. But two, I didn't know if people were <laughs> looking at LinkedIn to see what I liked and didn't like, right? Like that was kind of like, oh, okay. So I think leadership's awareness of the meaning that people are making of those things, that's one. And the biggest thing is if you accept behavior that is not in alignment with your values, that undermines your culture just immediately. And you as whatever C-suite position may think that it's justified or that there's some other critical business reason why you're doing it. But I just think that you can't underestimate the impact on a wide scale of what that means, because you're basically telling people that value whatever those contributions are over the stated values, and you just undermine your culture immediately. To your point, it's like what's not said versus what's said. So like, I'm a big fan of like vibes speak louder than words. And so you can say, 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 but when you do, 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 that's counterproductive to what you say, that just creates the vibes and you don't have to say anything at all. They just speak for themselves. A hundred percent. I mean, it's the same thing as like your kids learn more from how you treat yourself rather than what you say. And so we all have to be aware of what we're doing or not doing. Yeah. There was one time I, I, we did an employee survey and we got thousands of lines of feedback, right? And there's one comment out of a thousand that said that the head of HR was unapproachable. And I'm like, unapproachable? That's, I don't, you know. So of course I want yeah. to follow up on it. And I, you know, I talked to my team and they're like, we don't know. And I talked to my 17 year old daughter and she says, yeah, you kind of have a RBF, which, you know, okay. <laughs> and then she goes, and she said, you're probably going from meeting to meeting. You're looking at your phone, you're carrying your stuff and you're just not looking up. And I was like, that's it, right? Like I wasn't aware as I'm walking through a lobby, probably someone was there and I didn't acknowledge them and I come off as unapproachable. So it's another example of like, it meant meaning to that person. And it's true yeah. that I was giving unapproachable advice, even though 
had I been present and, and more intentional, I obviously wasn't trying to be unapproachable. So those kinds of things stick with me as a leader. And I share that with clients about just how to be more aware because you think you're just a person walking to your next meeting, but really like people are making meaning of it. Gosh, there's been this key theme that I'm picking up on mo more recently, probably over the last week of people I've been talking to about our kids being a really good reminder of like who we are in like the truest form and us as kids and like who we were as our authentic self and going back to that place. So it's like both sides because my kids would say the same thing to me and I've learned a lot from them. I've worked in a job and they're like, when are you going to stop being so upset all the time? And I'm like, oh, wow. They hear me. They see me. And they know like this environment isn't good because all they see me is as upset about something. Yeah. Not with them, but like in the person that I'm working with or the situation that I'm talking about. It's just like this general tone of like upset. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh. Wow, how awful for that. The vibes I'm creating for them are terrible. <laughs> My daughter came home one day and she's like, yeah, you don't like people. I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I'm in the business of Okay. That's, a, that's an interesting oh message. Yeah. yeah. You're like, okay, I need to snap out of it. Figure it out. What's driving this terrible, yeah, RBF, the right? <laughs> Totally. I don't ever forget. I was on a call, you know, and I was a single mom. So my daughter was with me a lot. She was under the table at board meetings and things. This particular time we're in the car, <laughs> she's in the back seat, and I'm on a call with a manager who wasn't being very effective. And I get through the call and I hang up and she goes, wow, that person's a manager. I'm like, yeah, my thought exactly. <laughs> You know, she's like 10 or something. I was just... It's, Maybe it's we fun. should bring our kids into the workplace a little bit more to humanize it, right? Or or like that poll, like where, you know, I think there's a trend of trying to teach people to give feedback. Like bring the kids because they'll just say it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like it is. And sometimes you're like, yeah, that's exactly what needed to be said because that's just the truth. And they said it like kindly because they said it from their heart. No agenda. It's just like a fact, not a feeling, right? Yes. I love that. Changing the bring your kids to work day format. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now let's talk about like where you're at today, right? You've developed this organization called Gig Talent. Tell me a little bit more about Gig Talent and like what is super important at the core of who you guys are in creating what you've created. The biggest thing was we believe everyone should be happy at work, right? Enjoy what you do. And if you are miserable somewhere, then you should not stay there. That's like the fundamental thing. And as I had gone on my own, I had a lot of peers, CHROs and, and others who were like, I want to do what you're doing, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of sales and business development. And I just want to do the work. And so Hannah and I were like, that's not a reason, like fear, right? We don't want you to be staying because yeah. of fear. And that doesn't mean everybody should be a consultant, but fear shouldn't be right. keeping you where you are. So we created Gig Talent really with that intention of helping people who have chosen to go on their own and really creating a sense of community. And at the same time, raising the bar of consulting, because when I was in-house and making that hiring decision, like lots of people can hang a shingle and say they're a consultant. And you know, that could mean like you're the biggest expert in your field, or it could mean like you couldn't get a job and you decided to hang a shingle, right? So, <laughs> so like, right, right. so we really wanted to set a standard of excellence in HR consulting and leadership coaching. And so that's what, that's like the value prop for clients. And we you know they yeah. partner with us and we help them really make sure that we're helping solve their root issues and get a resource that can partner with them in the right way. Mm -hmm. And then for our, we call it the collective, our gig talent collective, it's a sense of community and it's really excellent people and peers who you can learn from and bounce ideas and have continued learning and yeah. all of those things. So yeah. the whole like consulting doesn't have to be a lonely gig thing. And so yeah. that's how it came together. And, and it is also about freedom, right? They're not our employees. They're people who are building their own businesses. It's not exclusive in their relationship with us. And I get asked a lot, like, well, why do people then want to do business with you? I said, well, I think hopefully we get them the work that they love. We have really yeah. great clients. We're easy to do business with. And it's yes. about the relationships at the end of the day. To stay true to that and to give your consultants like the best opportunities with the clients, how do you, one, vet the consultants? And then same on the client side too. Like how do you ensure that you're getting the right clients in order to serve the purpose that Gig Talent was created for? 
We develop what we call a certification process. So we actually have a wait list for people wanting to join Gig Talent. We realized at first it was like, thank God I had good, talented friends that I trusted because it was like, hey, come on. But over time, it really evolved. So our certification process does include an assessment that tells us a lot about the person and how they make decisions and how they are to work with. We do reference checks, background checks. Uh, We do really in-depth interviews because- like, you know, you are probably similar. Like I can do lots of things. That doesn't mean I should do all of those things, right? right. And so what, what is my sweet spot? Yeah. And so really working to understand that with everyone who is part of the collective, those are all part of that process. And then on the flip side with clients, kind of a no jerks policy, really. I think it's just a starting yeah. point. But also it might be an ideal client for one consultant and not for another. So that matching, there's it's an art and a science, but we do that work up front on both sides so that we can hopefully find that sweet spot. And usually we present a few options to clients and then they select the one that's right for them. But the feedback we get is that consultants are loving the work that they're doing that they get through us. Yeah. And that makes me really happy because we want them to love yeah. the work they do. You're like a professional matchmaker. I, we almost called it that, but it didn't, it didn't go very far. No. <laughs> We, we went with the talent agent, like a sports agent or a talent agent, yeah. right? but for each yeah. other. Well, and it's such an interesting space to be in, right? Because you don't really, and I think this is like the way of the world changing, right? Like the gig economy is big. It is big. And I recently read an article about organizations and their learning and development groups becoming more open to the idea of creating development opportunities like an internal gig economy to an organization so that they can retain employees, right? Because they want to do different things. They want to try out different things. And then they don't feel like they have the opportunity to do that. So this is awesome because people do have the opportunity to like opt in and opt out, right? At their own discretion. It is the trend. Companies that are doing that well have created internal marketplaces so that people can use different parts of their skill set or interest or even explore things and not be incentivized to go out externally. I saw some data recently, I think it was by Josh Burson, but it was saying that the perception is it's easier to go get a job externally than it is to transfer internally in a lot of organizations. And that's a mistake, right? So companies that are navigating communities, even of like uh, alumni, right, ex-employees, there's So they're getting really good at that. They're breaking down the work and not just thinking about full-time jobs. And then they're innovating in how they fill that. So there's internal opportunities for gig talent. They're partnering with consultants and and the gig economy in different ways and really integrating those into key roles, right? And there's times when you're building something or you need specific expertise, or even if it's ongoing expertise, but it's not a full-time job. And they're really thinking differently about that talent ecosystem. And I think we were an early mover in that. And the, and the consultants that we have, I would just say are higher caliber, not only because of our process, but also because they're, they're entrepreneurs who are building their own practice, who specialize in something, whatever it is, and they just bring that excellence. And so for companies, it's like, because if you're going to bring in a consultant, it should be somebody who can hit the ground running, right? And so I think it just works kind of all the way around. And then you can be you, right? Because I imagine these consultants similar to myself or, you know, you know your true purpose, what your zone of genius is, if you will, right? And you've already explored that and maybe gone through those good experiences or those bad experiences or worked through the fear of like, can I really do this? And then you're like, yeah, I can. You get to the other side and you're like, I totally can. And I know that I can create the environment or the vibe or the culture that is going to Really, and align that with like who they are and who the client or the company is. And then it's magic, right? If you can get that right, it's magic. I think that's something big that I probably don't talk about enough, but I think that's the other reason, right? Like think about it yourself. Once you've made that leap and done that work and kind of personal exploration, you don't want to go work for a consulting firm that's going to force you into their process and their templates and their way of thinking. Like, if you wanted to be an employee and be a consultant, you can do that, but that's a different journey than what you just explained. Right. And so I think our consultants really love that because we're not the consulting firm, right? We're, they're the consultants. And so we're really supporting them in being yeah. th- themselves and living in their strengths. And so that is a differentiator and it's true to yeah. who we are too. So there's one other thing that you brought up that I think is so interesting and something that I have been doing more research on and it's this alumni network, which 
you brought it up and I think you lived it out at the beginning of our conversation because I took you back to the four seasons and you're still talking about it, right? And it's like, wow, from like a brand recognition, a brand promise of all the things that like you're still talking about the four seasons in such a positive way. And how often I see people leave an organization and they're like, I hate it there. My boss was a jerk or they treated me poorly. Or I mean, all you have to do is go on Glassdoor and just right. look. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I am a firm believer that organizations don't spend enough time on what that process looks like as somebody is exiting the organization in order to create the alumni experience or the exit experience, which then turns into the alumni experience that represents their brand in the marketplace far beyond when they totally. actually worked. I think it's a really good point. And I think it ties to the consistency in living your values and kind of what we we're talking about things that undermine culture. Like your existing employees watch how you treat people as they exit the building. And they know if you treated them poorly or if you don't right. care about their opinion or if you don't listen to the feedback that they're giving or whatever the thing is. Right. And so I think... Yes, there's tools and systems and actual ways to create communities of those alumni and all of those things. But even if you're not there yet, really thinking through, you know, we don't want to be like, yeah, like that person leaves and then you're bad talking them and talking about how much they suck. Like that doesn't reflect well, right? And so I think just being consistent in your values, whatever the situation, like 100% of the time is it's those behaviors and actions that, that set culture and tone. Okay. So as we think through like uh, people listening or the community that you engage with, what's the one thing or piece of advice or one thing that you practice daily that really helps set the vibe for you maybe personally and within your organization at Gig Talent? Gosh, two are coming up for me. I, it's really community and gratitude. Those are like the two that come up. I mean, I think I've said community like 500 times since we've been talking, but I that you know, for me, it's really at a values level. Like I just have a belief that you should contribute to the communities that you're part of, whether that's where you live, you're the school community, that work professional community, whatever that is. So yes. definitely community. And for me, it's like really amazing that the company we've created is actually founded in community. So for me, that is like a full circle moment. And then just gratitude. I think one of the the richness in life is, is the people around you and, and the quality of relationships. If I can do something for someone, I will always do it without any expectation of return and just feeling immense gratitude for having incredible people around. And I think that in our workplaces, in our companies, in our neighborhoods, that can go really yes. far. I agree. And it, gratitude can be a big word, but it can be really small things that you do to show gratitude to others that can light them up for the day. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to do something a little bit about you, right? In this okay. lightning round. Um, All right. Because I think it just helps personalize things and who you are. So I'll just ask you this or that, and you just answer whatever comes top of mind. And if you want to share why, you certainly can, but there's no expectation for that. All okay. Right. So coffee or tea? Coffee. Day or night? Probably day. Mountains or beach? Yeah. I like both. That's why we live here. <laughs> Probably a beach. I like walking at the beach. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs for sure. And last one, theater or Netflix or streaming services? Mm, theater. I just went uh, downtown with my mom on Sunday and it was amazing. So yeah, super fun, the theater. That's awesome. Was it like a live show, live musical, something like that? Yeah, it was It was really, really fun. We saw Mamma Mia. It was Oh, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, super fun. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And then you get to be in community, right? You don't even know the people that you're with necessarily, but you get to be in community with others. It's so cool. One of the times we talked, you mentioned singing and we did a lot of it on Sunday, but I'm not going to do it today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is amazing how music can create such a feeling or an energy and a vibe. I know if my kids are ever in a bad mood in the car, I um, will turn up the volume on the radio and like roll down the windows because we live in California, so we can yeah. most of the year. And it's like the fresh air and like the music. It's like, okay. And then I'll turn it down and be like, are you guys, are you guys better? <laughs> That's part of like that, like cognitive behavioral kind of tuning into being present in the moment and feeling yeah. the things around you. And I think music for sure plays a part in that. 
Yeah. And I'll spare everybody from my singing too. So the louder the music, the less they can hear me. Totally. I really do like to sing the words. I don't always have the right words. I just yeah. have the words that I think that they are. 100%. And it's coming out. It just feels so good, right? <laughs> I'm so with you. I'm so with you. And I feel bad for our passengers, but you know what? It's awesome. Anything else you feel like is important for people to know? No, thank you for having this. I think, you know, we all want to have good vibes and have great places to work. And I just think that everyone deserves that. So if you're somewhere where you don't feel it, just recognize you have choice. How often do we think, feel, and act out of fear? I just love that Jamie shared some great examples of what happens when we let fear creep in and how that impacts the vibes for ourselves and our teams. She also shared an incredible experience she had while working at the Four Seasons and how a business reacts to change can really change the trajectory of vibes and the process to rebuild. It's those micro moments and decisions that have everlasting impact on work vibes. You can connect with Jamie on LinkedIn at Jamie Jacobs or through her website at gogigtalent.com. If this episode inspired you and you want to see how you can take the next step to creating a better vibe within your organization, I'd love for you to download our complimentary 75 Vibes worksheet. This is a simple tool to create a habit and mindset around creating great vibes in work and life. The best part, it's simple and it works.